Good morning. So happy to be here worshiping with you here this morning. So many of my friends, hi Millie, glad to have you with us. So many of you are my friends and I'm happy to have you here worshiping with us here at the Brandon Seventh-day Adventist Church this morning. Um, there are a lot of things going on. They're all in your bulletin. If you would please read your bulletin, otherwise I'll be 10 minutes reading them to you. So I know that you can read. Please take a look at your bulletin and, and all the stuff that's in there. One of the things is that you're, they want you to sign up, I believe, for the women's ministry and the sign-up sheet is out there. So uh, that's the one thing I was told that is not in the bulletin is that the sign-up sheet for the women's ministry event is out there. Joe Kinker, we are so happy to have you back here this week. Joe, Joe's happy to be back. Joe had a heart attack this week. You wouldn't know that by seeing him today because of uh, how well he's doing. And uh, I went and visited Joe, and Joe, went, every person who came into his room, every, every nurse, every technician who came in, Joe was witnessing to them. I have, have a blessed day. So happy to have you here. Thank you for helping me. Joe, it was great to see you witnessing constantly for that. Um, I think that we're going to try to get the pastor up and talking. He has, I heard his sermon at first service, and you are going to be blessed to have that service, to hear his message today. And uh, so we're going to go ahead and get started. The first thing on our list here today is a children's story, and then a baptism, and then we'll have praise time. So announce what? Oh, yeah. Okay. So thank you, Sarah. This is Sarah. Sarah, wave to the people. Okay. So um, there's a social this evening. It is in your bulletin. Sarah just wanted to make sure there was extra notice that there's a, a, a social event this evening here at the church. And uh, you may want to come out. It, a fun time will be had by all who come with the right attitude. All right. What's that? Oh. <laughs> Joe, what would I... Thank you so much. Is there... There are, I know. Is there anybody who is here for the very first time today? Could you raise your hand? We're not going to call you out. We want to give you a gift. There's somebody right here. There's someone over there. We want to give you a gift. Is there somebody over here? Right there? Anybody else here for the very first time? Thank you, Joe, for reminding me. I appreciate it. All right. Okay, so we're going to have our children's story now. Um, when the children come up, they're going to be looking for pictures of presidents. And you can find those pictures of presidents in your billfold. Every uh, dollar, quarter, five dollar, ten dollar has a picture of a president on it. If you can get one of those pictures out and give them to the kids on their way up, that would be great. Here is your. Right? It's the it's odd. Quicker. I'll get a clicker. Good morning. Everyone looks so springy. All right, today we're going to do, we're going to look at some pictures. Can you see the picture? What do you see? A donkey. Jesus went to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. He rode on into Jerusalem on a young donkey. Okay, now what do you see? A palm tree which has palm branches. A large crowd spread their coats. 
in palm branches on the road, and they shouted, Hosanna to the son of David, Hosanna to the highest in heaven. Okay, what's the next picture? Money. Money. It's 30 pieces of silver. <laughs> Judas, one of the 12 disciples of Jesus, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus. And the chief priests gave him 30 pieces of silver. Okay, now what do we see? A towel. A towel. During the Passover meal, Jesus got up and he took off his outer clothes, like his coat, and he wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a large bowl and he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around his waist. Okay, what's the next picture? Wine and bread. Wine and bread. While they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them and said, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Okay, what's the next picture? After the Passover meal, Jesus went with his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. Going a little further ahead, Jesus fell down with his face on the ground and he prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then the soldiers came to the garden, and they arrested Jesus. What's that? It's not a hen. What is it? A rooster. Someone said to Peter, you know Jesus. And Peter said, no. And someone said, Jesus is your friend. And Peter said, no. Then Peter replied the third time, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as they were speaking, the rooster crowed. Jesus turned, and he looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken to him. Jesus said to Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. Jesus was, at Peter was sad and he walked away. All right, what's the next picture? A crown of thorns. The soldiers took off Jesus' clothes, and they put a purple robe on him. They twisted thorns together to make a crown, and they placed it on his head. Then they spit on him, and they hit him repeatedly on his head. They pretended that they were worshiping him. They were mocking him and making fun of him. Next picture. A cross. After they mocked Jesus... They led him away to crucify him, and they nailed him to a cross. What do we see? A stone. a stone. Joseph placed Jesus in a tomb, and he rolled a large stone in front of the entrance, and then he went away. But later, the chief priests and the Pharisees put a seal on the stone, and posted some gods near it. What do we see? It's spices and perfume. On the first day of the week, some woman, early, early in the morning, went to the tomb to prepare Jesus' body with the spices and perfumes. But when they got there, what do you see? It, it, it's the tomb, and is there anyone in it? No. 
they found an empty tomb. They saw that the stone was no longer in front of the tomb because it had been rolled away and the body of Jesus was not there. But then they saw an angel and the angel told them, Jesus is not here. He has risen from the dead. Jesus has risen for each and every one of us. That's why we're celebrating this weekend because it is such a wonderful blessing to know that Jesus died for us and he is risen and he is alive. And someday we can live in heaven with Jesus. Okay, let's say a prayer. Anybody want to say a prayer for me? Okay, you. Our Father, pleasing heaven, how will be your name? Let your kingdom come here on earth as in heaven. Give us your daily breath. Do not let us fall into temptation. Father, forgive our iniquities and our trespassings. Make us bear fathers of your words and your commandments. Shine your light upon us. O oh, your Holy Spirit dwell within us. Accept our prayers and dedications. All these prayers we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, church. What a beautiful Sabbath today. A wonderful Sabbath where the Christian world is celebrating and remembering the death and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. We're very happy for that, but it's also an extra special Sabbath. Move some more, please. It's also an extra special Sabbath because today we have two souls that have decided to give their lives to Jesus. And I would like for Michelle and Drake uh, to please join me in the baptismal pool. And actually, as is almost a custom and a tradition, our brother Earl is also going to be present here uh, baptizing today. So please, if we could come in and look at Drake in his Pathfinder uniform. Amen. So I, I, I just would like to say that it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure to be able to uh, study the Bible with Drake. Drake, ever since he came to this church, he, he loved this church. Can we say that? Yeah. Just from day one. And, and why wouldn't he? We have a beautiful church family, amen? Yeah. And we have a great Pathfinder group. I want to actually commend the Pathfinder group that is here today. Thank you for your solidarity in, uh, in being here and doing this uh, show of solidarity and love to Drake. You know, um, you guys befriended him, took him in, and mom tells me that he loves the Pathfinders. He loves being part of the Pathfinder group. So for the leaders that are here and to the kids as well, thank you so much. This right here that is happening today in parts is happening because of the love that you guys have shown him. So that's, that's the influence that you guys have had on, on Drake. And when we've been together in studying the Bible, 
He loves studying the Bible. He's always asking, when can we have the next Bible study? When can we have the next Bible study? So we're very happy that he has decided uh, to give his life to Jesus. And Drake, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray over you right now, and we're, we're going to get you into the water because you're going to publicly now accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior in front of your family and, of course, your church family too, okay? So let's... Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, because you are a God that makes all things new. Because here is a young man. He could have taken many paths in this world, but he chose Jesus, Father. We thank you for the enthusiasm that you have put into his life to follow you. He loves spending time in this church. He loves studying your word. He loves his Pathfinder team, Lord. And I just ask, Lord, that today as we baptize him, that you baptize him not just in water, but with the Holy Spirit. Amen. So that he can continue growing in faith and in a relationship with you. Because you know that you, we know that you are coming soon. So, Father, as a minister of this gospel, I now baptize Drake. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 It's been my distinct pleasure, privilege, uh, to work with Michelle. Um, she's a wonderful young lady. She's always attentive, always willing to learn, always willing to hear what the scriptures has to say. So, my dear Michelle, today it is my distinct privilege and pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. What a glorious moment. What a beautiful moment for this family. Amen? Amen? And now that we're here, we want to vote this family into membership. Is there a motion? motion. Is there a second? Amen. All those in favor? Amen. 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 Thank you so much, church. And thank you guys so much for joining our church family. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, Church family. We have the uh, honor and the privilege to be able to praise the Lord this morning in song for everything he's done in our life, especially in this special weekend, Resurrection Weekend. We invite you to sing with us this morning. We don't want this to be a, a duet. We want it to be a choir. Amen? Amen? So sing with us this morning as we sing Above All Powers and Kings. You guys know this song. Oh, 
the ways of man. For you were here before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonder the world has ever known. treasures of the earth. There's no way to measure what you're worth. Crucified, lay behind the storm. You live to die, rejected and alone like a rose. Trampled on the ground, you took a fall and thought of me above all, all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things. Of all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Lift your voices. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders, the world has ever known. treasures of the earth. There's no way to measure what you're worth. Crucified, lay behind the stone, live to die, rejected and sound wonderful. You ever think to understand or have you considered what Jesus was thinking about when he was on the cross? He was thinking about me, he's thinking about Joe, he's thinking about Saska, Melanie, he was thinking about all of you. And he thought of you so much that he would rather die and risk not being with his father for eternity than to not have a you with him. Amen? What an incredible thought that he, he loved us so much and he knew us he knows everything about us, but despite, he died for us. Amen. 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 I believe in the sun. I believe in the risen one. I believe I overcome by the power of His blood. Amen. Amen. I'm alive. I'm alive because He lives. Amen. Amen. Let my soul. Join the one that never ends Because he lives 
dead in the grave. I was dead in the grave. I was covered in sin and shame. I heard mercy call my name. He rolled the stone away. Amen. Amen. I'm alive. I'm alive because He lives. Amen. Amen. Let my song join the one that never ends because He lives. Because he lives. Amen. Will you guys stand with us as we sing our call to worship this morning? As we come to the Father's throne, we come before him. We come in prayer. Now, dear Lord, as we pray. Our hearts and minds far away from the press of the world all around to your throne where your grace does abound. May our lives be transformed by your love, may our souls be refreshed. From above, at this moment, let people everywhere join us now as we come to you in prayer. You to kneel with me as we seek the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this Sabbath day, the opportunity to come and to worship you as our God and Creator. Today we are resting from our normal work, and even in the act of salvation, Lord, you rested on the Sabbath day. Dear Heavenly Father, we are seeking your blessing this morning. We ask that you would open our hearts to the message that Pastor Rowley has for us. We also ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to touch his lips that the message that he brings us will be the one that is from you. And Lord, if you have a different message, please help him to feel impressed to bring that. But Lord, we trust that he is, his preparation has got us, has us waiting for a message from you this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we live on this world, and in this world there are troubles. There are physical troubles, mental troubles, health troubles, social troubles. We thank you so much for Joe Kinker, who is back with us today. Lord, we love you, we praise you, we ask that you would please help us to work with you each day to share the message that you love people, you love all people, you love the people of Brandon, you love the people of this church, and you care for them and wish only their best, and that their best will include accepting the love and grace of Jesus Christ, dying on the cross, 
for the forgiveness of sins. Lord, thank you so much. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We have many ways of worshiping, and one of the ways that we worship is acknowledging that God has given us everything. And so this is our opportunity to return a faithful tithe and to return an offering that is commensurate with your appreciation for what God has given you. I don't know about you, I have much to be thankful for. I woke up this morning. I had a brain. I was thinking. And although I was a little bit sore from all the work I did at Ben and Tria's house yesterday, uh, it was good to feel those muscles that haven't worked that way in a while. So I praise the Lord for all he's done for me. Everything that I have, everything that I am, comes from the Lord. And I want to praise him for that. I give you this, we give you this opportunity to return incommensurate with that. Any loose offering will go to the local church budget, where the Brandon Church is working to let the people of Brandon know that God loves them. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all that you do for us daily, every single day. We ask that you would please help us and be with this offering that is going out, that others may know that you love them as well. In Jesus' name I ask and pray and thank you. Amen. Sabbath church. Uh, Happy Sabbath. I, uh, I called uh, Melanie to do, the, do a number and she picked this day for me. <laughs> I didn't realize our anniversary was so close to this day, even after seven years. Uh, we were married here in this church. I'm, I met Wendy in uh, San Jose, Costa Rica in Central Park uh, one year, uh, eight years ago. And uh, I just wanted to say um, she has been, uh, well, this song we're going to sing is great, great as, <laughs> <It's> <laughs> about to cry, I know. <laughs> is great as thy faithfulness, and uh, uh, yeah, to, uh, this song has a parallel message to me, it's a love song and a worship song to God, but it's also a love song and a worship, and, and a, for people. I look at it that way. I see that parallelism. And if you, as you listen to the words that she sings, you can, you can see that. Um, and I just want to say a few words about Wendy. Um, she has, time has gone by so fast. I, I didn't even realize it's seven years. Um, and she's, she's more value than, than rubies, you know, like Proverbs 31 says. And she doesn't, she, she, doesn't bring any harm to me. And uh, so I, I almost, I almost uh, died on February 1st. I had a uh, little problem. I had a little surgery afterwards. And being a man, us men want to know, we could take it. I'm okay with that pain, you know. And she's like, oh, no. <laughs> You're not okay with that I pain. I don't want to be a widow. <laughs> <laughs> so sure enough, I got up to the hospital, and they're like, yeah, we're glad to see you because you were, you were heading out. And uh, so I can't say enough good about her. She's a, she is my rock. Okay, so we're going to play. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I love you too.
So there, uh, we had a business meeting this last Saturday evening. And um, sometimes we, in leadership positions, we might think that we'd like to have it be a theocracy or a dictatorship, but it is not. The Seventh-day Adventist Church does not work in either of those modes. We work as a democracy. And so we had a meeting last Saturday evening, and we evaluated an offer, a verbal offer that has come to the church, and we have decided to accept that verbal offer if it comes through as a, an official offer, and as long as the lease conditions are acceptable to us. Are we going to be able to cohabitate together? So on Tuesday, April the 16th, there will be a board meeting, not a business meeting. And at that board meeting, we will review the terms of that lease agreement. And if the terms of that lease agreement and if the terms of the offer are what they have told us they were going to be, the Brandon Seventh-day Adventist Church will be selling this facility. And we will be cohabitating forward with the Tabernacle Bible College and Seminary, who would be the new owners. Um, so for those of you who were the, at our meeting this last Saturday night, that will not be a surprise to you. That's what we said at the meeting. We voted. Um, but for those of you who weren't there or didn't hear, that is the, what the situation is. If we, at that board meeting on Tuesday the 16th, decide that the lease agreement is, in fact, equivalent to basically the same as what we've been given verbally and the lease terms are appropriate, we will then make an offer for the property across the street to be the new home of the Brandon Seventh-day Adventist Church whenever we save enough money to actually build on it. So I um, was required, asked to give a heads up, re a report, pastor, anything more? Fantastic. If you are a ministry leader, uh, you, we will make, please make sure that you've done the, the, um, the um, survey so we make sure that we are trying to meet the needs of the, all of the different service ministries here at the church. All right, now let's get from, from that back into our worship service. Luke chapter 24, verses 30 to 32 is not supposed to be read by me. It's supposed to be read by you. Come on up. Thank you, Melanie. Um, today's scripture reading is from... Found in Luke 24, 30, 32. And it came about when he had re reclined at the table with them that he took the bread and blessed it. And he broke it and began giving it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to one another, were our hearts not burning within us when he was speaking to us on the road while he was explaining scripture to us? Happy Sabbath, Church. Happy Sabbath. What a beautiful Sabbath here in uh, the Brandon area. A special Sabbath where we are uh, celebrating the resurrection of our Lord. And we thank you, our church family, for being here today. We thank our church family online. Thank you for joining us last night, those who did. And if you're joining us today, thank you so much for making Brandon Seventh-day Adventist Church your home uh, this Sabbath uh, afternoon. Today is a great Sabbath as we uh, get to preach about the living Christ. Um, it's a great Sabbath because we had baptisms, amen? amen? God is good. We have a great ministry here in Pathfinders um, supporting our young people, uh, allowing them to develop friendships and relationships and teaching them about Christ. My collar. Uh, it, it's a new... It's a new trend I'm starting now, but I, I, the church might not be ready. You're right. I should just, yes, but thank you. That's what happens when, you, when you're rushing all over the place after baptism. So it might not be the first. I guarantee it won't be the last. But, uh, but I'm very happy. I'm very happy to see that our, our, our pathfinders, uh, our kids, right, love our church so much. I mean, it, it was real. Every time I talked to Michelle, she told me, Drake can't wait 
to go to church, and he can't phantom that, he's, that he has to miss a Sabbath because he's sick or he has to travel to visit someone else. So that's when I hear that our young people uh, like being in this place, love our church, love our church family, it shows us, you know, um, the intentionality uh, behind our leadership in loving our young people and discipling them uh, to love Jesus. Um, and today, you know, the, we're going to continue afterwards. Everyone here is invited for potluck, for potluck here uh, right after church. And then we're going to have a seminar on the resurrection. It's going to be uh, more of a historical analysis of the resurrection, presenting evidences for and even some of the concerns that skeptics, agnostic, and atheist biblical scholars have on the resurrection of Jesus. And if you're someone that wants to strengthen their faith, wants to know more uh, than just what the Bible says, but from what the historical record says, and even what um, I would say, if you're someone that's a high school student, college student, that's going to be going to colleges, especially non-Christian colleges, I think this is something that will benefit you greatly. So you can see the amount of uh, evidences there are uh, in favor, strong evidences for the resurrection of Jesus. So that's going to happen immediately after potluck. And then at 7 p.m., we finish the Sabbath with a nice church-wide social. So everyone's invited to that as well. Packed Sabbath um, and very excited to be here. Uh, before we open our, our scripture for today and we start with our sermon, I would like to uh, bow our heads and we can start with a prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for the opportunity to be here gathered as a church family, coming to you, Lord, to pray, coming to you to worship, coming to you, Lord, in adoration because of who you are and what you have done for us at that old rugged cross, Lord. Father, I ask that the Holy Spirit can come into this building today and not just be in this building, but be present in the hearts and minds of all the members and friends that are here today of our congregation. Uh, if there's any anxiety, if there's anything that's troubling us, that your Holy Spirit can push that away so that the words that are spoken here, Lord, can be straight not from a man, but from God himself, Lord. So whatever I need to take out of my sermon today, please put that aside. And if you need to speak something through me, I ask, Lord, that you take control and that you speak to your church. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The title of today's sermon is Encountering Jesus on Emmaus Road. Encountering Jesus on Emmaus Road. And I'm going to start with a story uh, something that occurred in, in the mid-1980s. It was a group of around 50 uh, critical Bible scholars. They created a seminar, right, a group uh, or basically a union of people called the Jesus Seminar, right? Sounds like a, like a cool name for a small group, this Jesus Seminar. So I would want to be part of something like that. Except that this group, their purpose was not to study the Bible in a devotional manner like we study the Bible in a devotional manner. They wanted to analyze the writings uh, found in the Gospels, the statements in the Gospels, and in the New Testaments, uh, to try to find who really was Jesus Christ. They wanted to pinpoint down what they termed as the historical Jesus. And what they did was that they developed methodologies to determine what was real and what was not real. They had these little color-coded beads, right? And each of these beads represented something. So, so, so one color of a bead could, and let's say red for argument's sake, was something that was 100%. This was, or, or close to 100%, this was a high likelihood that this is true in the life of Jesus. There, were, uh, there was another color-coded bead that represented something that there was some debate about, but we couldn't really be too sure. And then there was another color-coded bead that was saying that that was a hit mythology, it was a myth, it was, not, it was not real. And after they finished this process, basically the historical Jesus, right, 
they concluded was a, in fact, a real person that was a good moral teacher, but anything that was attributed to him or the disciples as something supernatural, that was considered a myth. So all the miracles, the resurrection, everything that, in, that enti entailed anything that was supernatural, they did not accept it. And as we see today, when you turn on the television or our devices, right, and we go and see the, the, the History Channel, the Discovery Channel, or even things on YouTube, there is a very big tension between what the Bible says who Jesus is and what these documentaries on Jesus by, uh, by these channels say who Jesus is. Because usually they're going to present Jesus from the perspective of the Jesus seminar scholars. They're highly influenced by these people and Jesus will be presented to our children, to our families as nothing more than a moral and good teacher, but not as a miracle worker, not as God on earth, not as the Son of God, and definitely not as a man that came and died and resurrected on the third day. And it is very interesting to see that when we ask, why do we believe in Jesus, or our kids ask us, why do we believe in Jesus, we really have no response outside of it's in the Bible. A response, so what about the Bible? What about the Quran? What about the sutras or, or the naturalist explanations that the atheist offers? And when we can't explain, we get angry at them. And usually that leads to tension because we cannot provide a good answer to our friends, family members, even our young people. Today we're going to study the question of who is Jesus Christ? That question has been one of the most highly, if not the most highly debated question in the past 2,000 years. And as we celebrate today, as we celebrate with the Christian world what Jesus did for us on the cross and his victory over the cross, it is important that as Christ followers, we have an understanding of who is Jesus. Who is Jesus Christ? And today... I plan on using what the Bible says, including the trusted prophecies of the Bible, plus extra biblical evidence. We're going to go a little, just a little bit into that, into who Jesus is and why we should have faith that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. So today, we're going to be studying the, the story of two disciples that had these same questions as they were going through a period of great doubt and sadness. They were walking on a road, it was called Emmaus Road, and they were leaving Jerusalem towards their home when something amazing is going to happen to them. And for that, I would like for us to go to Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 24. Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 24. And we also have it on the screen as well, but it is always refreshing to hear the sounds of the rustling Bibles, even in this age, it still feels good. Amen, amen. amen. Verse 13, uh, and behold, two of them, so it's talking about the two disciples, two of them were going to that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things which had taken place. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus approached and began traveling with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. Verse 17, and he said to them, What are these words that you are exchanging with one another as you're walking? And they stood still, looking sad, and one of them named Cleopas answered to him and said, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened here in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said, The things about Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word in the sight of God and of all the people, and how the chief priests 
and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all of this, it is the third day since these things happened, but also some women among us amazed us. When they were at the tomb early in the morning, they did not find his body, and they came saying they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it exactly as the women had said, but him they did not see. See, the followers of Christ, up to this point, right before Jesus had joined this conversation, had joined them on this walk, their life had been turned upside down in such a short amount of time. You know, days before, they had been shouting, Hosanna, right? They were going to crown Jesus as king. They saw that he was their Messiah. And just a couple of days later, Jesus was crucified. I mean, he suffered the worst of deaths. He was crucified un unfairly, right, against their law in secret. He was whipped 39 times with a, a Roman whip that had these balls of iron with hooks that every time they hit you, they took a piece of skin out and they made you bleed. And after almost beating him to death, they forced him to carry this cross that was not made for him, walk all the way to, the Gol to Golgotha where they put nails through his arms, through his, through his hands, and through his feet. They crowned him with a crown of thorns. They took his clothes and they started mocking and spitting him and making fun of him. And telling him if he's the son of God, why doesn't he just come down from the cross? When he was thirsty, they gave him vinegar instead of water. And eventually, when he died, they put a spear through the side of his, through his ribcage, where water and blood sprouted out, showing that Jesus' heart had had burst. He had been transferred to a tomb. He had rested there on, on Saturday. And their whole world must have been the most depressing Sabbath that the disciples ever had, his followers ever had. What had happened? Christ had done so many wonderful things. How could someone that had made, you know, people's lives, created so many miracles in people's lives, someone they were so sure of was going to be king, was the Messiah that they were waiting for? How could everything that they hoped for had now turned into the worst possible scenario, the worst case scenario? Their king was that. Had they been living a lie? Then something amazing happened. The third day, as some women are going to come and on Sunday morning to prepare his body, they find that the stone has been opened. And when they walk in, they don't see Jesus. They don't see a dead body. They see an angel, two angels. And they're telling him, you're not going to find Jesus here. He is not here. He has risen. And these women, the Gospel of Mark says, they were in shock because imagine seeing two angels telling you this and you're expecting to find a dead body and you don't find a dead body. You find angelic beings telling you that Christ has resurrected and that uh, and the roller coaster of emotions of shock and not knowing what to do turns into adrenaline and we need to run and tell the disciples what have happened except no one believes them. The, Bible, the biblical accounts registers that no one, not even the disciples, Peter thought they were crazy. These women are hallucinating. And he goes and he checks out for himself and realizes that the tomb is indeed empty. Now, anyone that was, that was seeing this as they're, as they're, as they're trying to, to think about what's going on, they're thinking, is this a joke? Are we being mocked? Are Christians, using a modern term, being trolled over here? The problem was that it was coming from the followers of Christ. They were shouting at the top of their lungs, and some people, the Bible says, were even saying that their relatives had come back from the dead 
witnessing to the fact that Jesus was risen. You can find in the Gospels that when Christ died, the tombs were open, and the Bible says that these people that on Friday night came to life, on Sunday were going to their friends and family members' doors and giving them almost a heart attack when they were seeing them that they were dead and they were telling them that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. So you have Judea exploding in chaos of what in the world is happening over here. And as they're telling these things to the stranger, the stranger, as they're talking about these things, the stranger comes in, Christ, right? They did not know it was him. And he's asking, what are you guys talking about? What is all this commotion? And it's like these people had just seen an extraterrestrial land. He's like, are you the one person in our area that does not know the things that have happened today? And he says that Jesus is going to walk with them for seven miles from Emmaus, from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Look what happened in that conversation as they're telling him that they are sad because now they don't know what to believe. Jesus says in verse 25 in Luke 24, O oh, foolish man and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for Christ to suffer, for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then, this is my favorite part of the whole chapter, beginning with Moses and with all of the prophets, he explained to them the, th the things concerning himself in all of Scripture. In other words, beginning with Genesis and the first five books of the Bible, that's Moses, all of the prophets, Jesus began explaining how all of the Old Testament pointed to the Messiah, pointed to Jesus. Now, that's a very important biblical principle we find. The Old Testament, every story in the Old Testament has one very important interpretive principle. When you read the Old Testament, the story of Joseph and Moses and, and, and the beginning in Genesis, you can't just read it by what it says on the text. It has to have a deeper meaning because Christ himself said everything in the Old Testament points to the Messiah. There is always a higher spiritual meaning that shows how those stories pointed to and connected to Christ. The Bible says, and Paul says in Romans, that Christ is the end of the law. It doesn't mean that Christ ended the law. The word that is used in the Greek means that Christ is the culmination of the law. In other words, the Old Testament is this drum roll, drum roll, drum roll that happens and the, when the bang occurs, Christ appears on scene, Christ dies, Christ saves, Christ resurrects. It is the saving, the plan of salvation of the Messiah. But what we see here is that Jesus is going to take the time to explain this to these disciples in a way that they have never seen or heard before. You know, um, I, as a Seventh-day Adventist, have been very blessed to study at the <coughs> seminary at Andrews University. I have been very blessed to study among some of the best Bible professors, I believe, in the world, that God has used them to explain and show us and teach us, the pastors, the Bible, in a very profound way. I'm so grateful. I feel so blessed. But what I would have given for Jesus to be my Old Testament <coughs> professor. Do you imagine walking with Jesus for seven miles and having God in the flesh explain the Bible to you, giving you a free course? A free course on the Old Testament? I would have loved to have been one of those foolish men. For Jesus to tell me, foolish man, but I'm a foolish man walking next to you, Christ. I would have liked to be one of those dumb disciples, foolish, 
that they didn't understand anything, but having the opportunity to walk seven miles, that's like what, three, four hours with Jesus, as he just opened up the Bible and he showed that everything pointed to him. I imagine Jesus opened up the word of God and started in the beginning. And, and explain to them that he was the seed of the woman of Genesis 3.15. That he was going to be their descendant that was going to come and destroy the snake. That he was the one that, that was the descendant of Abraham that was going to be a light to all the nations. He showed them how the Messiah was going to come from the tribe of Judah. How that was prophesied in the Old Testament. And how Christ came from the tribe of Judah. That he was the heir of the throne of David. That his birthplace was going to be in Bethlehem. Just like it had been prophesied in, in Micah. That he was going to be born of a virgin. Just like Isaiah said that the virgin shall conceive and you shall call him Emmanuel. That had a deep meaning. The deep meaning was not just in the time of, of Isaiah was a lady going to conceive. A young lady was going to conceive. That had a deeper meaning. A real virgin was going to conceive. And his name was going to be God is with us. And God had come into the scene. He, just, he showed them that the Old Testament had talked about how Jesus was going to be sold for 30 pieces of silver. That he was going to be accused by false witnesses. That he was going to be crucified with evil people, with guilty people. That they were going to pierce his hand and his feet. That soldiers were going to gamble for his clothing. That no bones in his body, right, and his legs were going to be broken. And even it prophesizes the Old Testament that the Messiah's side was going to be pierced. And that he was going to be resurrected. There are over 44 Old Testament prophecies that deal with the Messiah and his first coming. But the most powerful of all, I would imagine, is that Jesus took them to the book of Daniel and showed them in Daniel 9 the beauty of a prophecy that had been staring right at their noses and that was going to be fulfilled. Let's look at Daniel 9, 24 through 27. The Bible says in Daniel 9, 24, 27, 70 weeks have been decreed or cut out for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin and make atonement for iniquity, to bring everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree, to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with a plaza, moat, even in the times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the Prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and its end will come with a flood, even in the end, there will be wars, desolations that are determined. And he will make a firm covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction. One that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. And we can have a chart right here that shows that the 70 weeks occurred exactly to the day, to the moment, to the hour of Jesus' ministry. In, in Bible prophecy, in apocalyptic prophecy, right, one of the big factors, right, that we need to understand is that there's this thing called the day-to-year principle. In other words, in Jewish prophecy, apocalyptic prophecy, when they talk about days and weeks, what they're really talking about is years. So 70 weeks translates, right, if you change a day for a year, is 490 years. And the prophecy said from the time that your city, Jerusalem, is rebuilt. So in the time of, of, uh, of Daniel, Jerusalem was not rebuilt. They were in Persia. Jerusalem was completely desolate and isolated. Eventually, 
there's going to be made an attempt, various attempts to rebuild it. And in 457 before Christ, there was a third decree by a Persian king named Artaxerxes, and he allowed for the complete construction and habitation of the city by the Jews. From 457 BC, when you look at that 60, at that, those 483 year period, you get right to the baptism of Jesus Christ to the day in 27 AD. 69 weeks, the end of that week, 27 AD, Jesus comes onto the scene and he is confirmed by God to start his ministry. Three and a half years later, in the middle of the week, it said that the sacrifices were going to cease because in the middle of the last week, of the last seven years, between 27 AD and 34 AD, Jesus Christ in 31 AD is going to be crucified. And the moment that Jesus Christ is crucified, something incredible happens in his crucifixion. The Bible says that there was a huge earthquake. People were coming out from the dead. Some people were coming to, uh, raised from the dead. But in the temple, the veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place, some believe, some scholars have suggested that this was a one-inch thick veil, so this wasn't a little tiny thing, was broken and cut from top to bottom supernaturally. In other words, no human hand did this. It just broke in half. Because what was happening here is that God was saying, because Jesus died, the real Lamb of God, you do not need to continue with these symbolic sacrifices. Remember, we had this principle, right? Everything that happens in the Old Testament has a greater fulfillment in the New Testament. Guess what? Those little animal sacrifices that occurred in the Old Testament was before the arrival of the Messiah. And now the Messiah, the real Lamb of God, had arrived to die once and for all, forever. One sacrifice for the salvation of all men. Jesus dies, the sacrifice ends, and at the end of the 70th week, Stephen, right, of the last three and a half years later, Stephen, the first martyr, as he's preaching to the Sanhedrin, is stoned to death for preaching Christ. And in that moment, the gospel became, went from being Jew-centric, followers of Jesus, converts of Jews that had accepted him, to God's people being spiritual Israel. In other words, a global movement where Gentiles, where non-Jewish people, can now partake into being part of the people of God. It is a gospel for everyone. And I imagine Jesus showing these disciples how this exact prophecy was fulfilled to the, to the exact minute. And the Bible says that their hearts were burning. Their hearts were burning. Look what Ellen White says, the desire of the ages. The Savior is revealed in the Old Testament as clearly as in the new. It is the light from the prophetic past that brings out the life of Christ, the teachings of the New Testament with clearness and beauty. The miracles of Christ are proof of his divinity, but a stronger proof that he is the world's redeemer is found in comparing the prophecies of the Old Testament with the history of the new. Church, there is very strong, powerful, historical, biblical evidence that the prophecies in Daniel give validity to the fact that Jesus Christ came to this world in exactly the day that he said he was going to come, appeared on the scene, died on exactly the day the Bible says, resurrected, and that the the gospel came and was brought to the rest of the world exactly how the Bible had predicted it. I'm telling you, there is reason to believe because the word of God is not Santa Claus. The word of God is not something that we have as a tooth fairy. The word of God is true. And we're going to see that Jesus is not just going to give them biblical evidence. He's going to do a miracle right in front of them. 
As they get to their house, look what happened when they finally get to their house. Their eyes were open. And in verse 30, it says, When he had reclined at the table, he took the bread and blessed it, breaking it, and he began giving it to them. And then their eyes, verse 31, were opened, and they recognized him. And look what he did. He vanished in their sight. And they said to one another, Were not our hearts burning with us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining scripture to us? You see, Jesus did something amazing. He revealed himself and he just vanished. And I'm going to tell you that we just don't have today great biblical evidence, right, for the existence of Christ. But there's going, there's, we're going to find that there's great historical evidence as well. I want to touch briefly just on three today of the historical record. And we're going to get a lot deeper into this if you stay for the seminar afterwards. But there's just three things that I just want to talk about uh, briefly. Number one fact that we see today is the empty tomb. And when I say fact, I mean that the majority of scholars, not scholars that are Christian, I'm talking about agnostic, atheist scholars, skeptical scholars, people that study the New Testament as if it was an ancient document but do not necessarily believe. The, the majority believe in the idea that the tomb was empty. They may not agree with the resurrection part, but they don't, but the overwhelming majority of all scholars today believe that the tomb was empty. And this was reported in six different sources that we have. It is found between 25 and 65 years after the cross, right? The Gospels, the Acts of the Apostles. Talking about 25 to 65 years, that's like talking to a Holocaust survivor. That's like talking to me in two years, in the 25 years, when I talk about 9-11 and I can tell if, if, if there's a child here and say, Pastor Rowley, what was 9-11 like? And I can just come out and say, well, I was here at this age. This is the type of source, of early source material that you find in the Gospels. And now why is that important? Because you see, the standard we have for Jesus, the, the evidence that we have for Jesus is so high compared to what we have for the rest of the ancient world. We have so much more sources for Christ, and they're all early and good, right? And you take someone like Alexander the Great, who no one here questions if Alexander the Great is real or not. No one here is questioning Alexander the Great. Our earliest source for Alexander the Great is 300 years. And it's not even a good source. Most scholars don't even use that source. The best source that we have for Alexander is 400 years after he was born, after he lived. So think about this. We have documentation that is dated to the time of the, of the epoch of when the disciples and Jesus were alive that were claiming, yes, that the tomb is empty. We also see that his death was reported by at least four non-biblical sources. And the other fact, before we go into the appearances of Jesus, was that the, the fact that the women found the tomb was, is something that is problematic for skeptics. You see, if you want to sell, right, the idea that Jesus rose from the dead, what you, you would have done, right, in that time in the first century, you would have Peter find the body. You would have had John find the body. Why? Because in the ancient times... In the first century uh, Near East, a woman's testimony was worth next to nothing. Generally, they were not accepted in a court of law. They needed at least, uh, for the most part, a corroborating male witness because obviously women at that time did not have the same you know, rights that we have today. They were considered second-class citizens. And it wasn't 100%, but for the most part, their testimony was worth very little. So if you're a biblical writer and you're trying to convince the world that Jesus rose from the dead, you're doing a very bad job by having the first people arriving at the tomb being women. That actually works. We call that embarrassing testimony. We'll talk about that later today. In other words, it weakens your argument for the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. So why would I weaken my argument by showing women as the first people that go and find Jesus' body. And the, and the thing is, all the Gospels say this. Unless, of course, 
that it is true fact that Jesus, disciples, the women, were the ones that were there first. If it was true, then you have to report the truth. Second thing is the appearances of Jesus after his death. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 7. If there is a, a Bible verse today that you should highlight, it is 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 7. Uh, this one is actually, uh, this passage here is what we call a biblical creed. In other words, a statement that you memorized early to, to memorize the, it was an easy way of memorizing the doctrines of the church, right? In this one specifically, memorizing the resurrection, it is believed that this statement predates the written gospels. This was days to weeks to months after the resurrection of Jesus. Most scholars agree that this happened in the early 30s, right after Jesus died. Remember, Jesus died in 31. So in the early 30s, people were already going around the streets, basically saying this. Look what, look what Paul says. For I delivered to you, uh, verse 15, as of first importance, what I also received. That Christ, number one, here's a creed, died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried, that's the second thing. He was raised on the third day, third thing, according to the scripture. And here are the appearances of Jesus. He appeared to Cephas, that's Peter. He appeared to the twelve. He appeared more to than to the five hundred, most of who remain until now. So when he's writing this, there's still almost 500 people that saw Jesus with their own eyes, and he is claiming, Paul, that this happened. But some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all of the apostles. So the second thing that scholars of all kinds, from all spectrums, basically believe with 90% plus percentage is that the appearances of Jesus was something that people believed, and they believe it because they trust Paul. They see Paul as a trustworthy person. We'll talk why about that later in the seminar. So based on Paul's testimony alone, the majority of New Testament scholars believe the disciples had experiences in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. And the third thing, the disciples believe in the resurrection. As Jews, disciples had no concept of a Messiah that would be executed by his enemies and would be brought back to life. In fact, the Jews believed that in the coming of the Messiah, very similar to Advent actually, that the only resurrection that was going to happen was going to be the resurrection in the end of the age, in the end of the world. So in their mind, a Messiah that was crucified, was damned by God, was condemned by God, was, couldn't be a Messiah, but then the fact that he would resurrect, that was nowhere near in their theology. So when they start coming out and they start preaching this message, they're preaching a message that is countercultural to everything in the Jewish system. A message that they were willing to, to not just sacrifice their lives, but the life of their families and their children. Now, this is very interesting about the early, uh, early church because they received persecution immediately from the Romans and from the Jews. Not a single Christian recanted. I'm going to say that again. Not one single Christian, early Christian, uh, that could be a disciple of Jesus, associates, or other of, of these 500, these early disciples that we don't even know, that were persecuted, that knew Jesus, not a single one recanted their faith. Now, um, Nixon's hatchman, when Watergate happened, and everyone got in trouble, and the FBI started questioning them, he became Christian, the guy that set everything up, he went to jail, found Christ, was born again. And then he started speaking one day on the resurrection. He's like, you know, 
I realized that the resurrection was true when Watergate happened. Because the moment that things got tough, that everyone was in rooms and they were being interrogated, everyone started lying about each other, everyone started switching their stories up, the whole case just fell apart the moment just a little bit of pressure happened. And when you look at the lives of the disciples, no one is going to sacrifice their life, the life of their family, the life of their children, without the fact that something incredible, unprecedented had happened where they knew they couldn't recant because it was the greatest thing that had ever happened. The disciples believe in the resurrection was so big that they were willing to die for Jesus. And today, most scholars believe, yep, they certainly, even if we don't agree with what they saw, they believed that Jesus was risen from the dead, and we cannot deny that. The historical record is clear. So what I would like to tell you, church, is that we have biblical evidence. We have historical evidence. And I want to tell you that the tomb today is empty, and we do not worship that tomb because Jesus Christ is alive. Our Lord is risen. And I'm going to tell you something. I could give you just, and we, I will give you a seminar this afternoon. And even more, we can go way deeper than this and talk about this. But I would say that is not even... That's from an intellectual point of view, right? You read the Bible, you read it, you, the historical record, everything starts making sense from an intellectual point of view. But I'm going to go as far as to say that God is looking to have more than just an intelligent relationship with you. God is looking to have an emotional relationship with you as a son and a daughter. And I can say I have witnessed the presence of a Savior that is real in my life many times. You know, when, when my daughter Janet was a little baby, she was around almost one year old, and she had been very, very healthy. But one day, she got sick. She had a stomach virus. Now, Janet, as you can see, she's a cute little girl. She's very skinny. Right? She is not, she's a very picky eater. She's eating more now. But when she was a baby, and my wife can testify about this, this girl was picky. We were stressing out because every time we went to the doctor's office, this lady would just take out, the doctor would take out a chart and like, yeah, you see this, the minimum weight, and she's like, all the way over here, and you really need to do something. And we try to give this girl everything, and I think out of one or two foods that she had, that was, she just didn't like anything. It's like the first kid that doesn't like bread. How? You know, it's just like, why? Or you're a kid. Eat something, you know? Anyways, it was just, it was tough. We had a, a very tough time. But having all these weight issues, all these weight problems, she gets the stomach virus, and now she's not eating nothing. And now, you know, she's, she goes to the ER. We come back. She doesn't get better. We have to go to the ER again. And it's just... To the point, I started feeling really concerned because I have all of this in my head and like, she's not eating, she's, you know, she's having all these weight issues. What if she gets really, really sick? Like this could be something, she's not even one year old yet and this could be something real bad that could happen and I started thinking the worst. So I remember being there and I started, you know, trying to see what I could do. And I, had, I started having some anxiety and I was legit scared because there was nothing that I could do. But this is what I want to tell you because, again, we serve a God that is relational and he is real and he loves us. Amen. Outside of all the intelligent stuff, which is great, we have a God who is real. And I remember in that moment, I just gave myself in to God. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to pray. I'm going to pray. And I started praying for Janet and I started praying for her health. And in that moment that I started praying, something happened. And what happened was, as soon as I started praying, I felt peace. It was supernatural. The anxiety that I was feeling was gone. And a thought just came into my head. And this was a thought I remember. I even wrote it down here so I can never forget it. It was, everything is going to be all right. And I'm going to tell you, obviously, everything was all right. Because God healed my daughter. Everything was fine. 
and I have a God who literally saw me, saw my needs, saw my anxiety, and saw it enough to send his Holy Spirit so that he could calm my nerves. Because guess what? I am important to Jesus. Which means that you and me, all of us, are important to Jesus. He cares about your life. He cares for you because we have a God that is not dead. You see, today we're here and the Christian world is not venerating a tomb. Like It's like, oh, the tomb of Jesus. We don't care about the tomb. You know why we don't care? Because our Lord is not there. Our Lord is risen and he wants you to experience the power of the living Christ today. If you are stuck in sin, if you're stuck in a life that is horrible right now, God wants to transform your life brick by brick, and he wants you to come and taste him, to come and experience what a relationship with God is and how transformative. And that doesn't happen by accident. You know, I could have just kept on going in that moment being anxious, but the moment I stopped and I connected with a real living being, God did something in that moment. That doesn't happen if there is a dead person. That only happens when there is a living God. So I'm telling you today that your life is not an accident. That, you're, that what you're going through is not an accident. You being here today is not an accident. Even if your life is going through a hard time, you have a purpose. And your purpose is to serve God, to love Him, to worship Him, because He has a purpose for you, and that is to save you so that you can live eternally. Your purpose is to live a life that's peaceful. A life that has plenty, not in this world, but in the world to come. God has something so great and so wonderful for us because he loves us. In other words, we have a God that no matter how jacked up or messed up your life is now, he sees it, he identifies it, and he says, you can come here and I will transform you. And I will save you. And I will make you into a new creature. You don't have to live hopeless. You don't have to live a life where you are constantly, you know, being broken down. Where you're constantly being judged by others. Let God be your judge. Let God be your healer. Let God be the one that resurrects a dead person into a living person. Amen. Love what Paul says to the Ephesians about the power of the living Christ. Ephesians 2, 4 to 6. But God, being rich in his mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. And raised up, look at that, raised up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Church, I'm telling you today that the tomb is empty and Jesus Christ is alive. God loves you. God wants to save you and he wants to transform your life. But you know how big God's love is? Do you want to know how irrational it is? Because I could tell you all day long, but sometimes I just want to show you and it is hard to describe how much he loves you and me because we sometimes are very, you know, um, I would say, person-centric, we think that the universe revolves around us. The sun, the moon, and the stars are revolving around Pastor Rowley, and not even, like, not, not even the air is revolving around me. You know what I mean? That's how we feel sometimes. I'm going to show you something. I want to show you a picture right now. And this picture was taken 30 years ago, right? That picture was taken 30 years ago by the Voyager 1 from space. That's a, a picture of the Voyager 1, 4 billion miles away from planet Earth. And it is called the pale blue dot. Now, the pale blue dot is right there, is that little pixel that you see in that beam of light. Maybe in the, mac, in the back you may not see it, but there's a, I promise you there's a pixel there, right? In that little beam of light, that looks like a little mistake, like a little much. That is Earth. Four billion miles. There we go. That is it. That's us right there, fam. That is us right there. That's not a mistake. That is Earth. Right? And if you see the whole screen, that's just a tiny fraction of the observable universe. In other words, that whole area is a tiny fraction. And that's the little dot 
that we're in right now. So the astronomer Carl Sagan, when that picture came back and he saw what Earth was, this is what he had to say. He's like, look again at that dot. That's here, that's home, that's us, and on it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being, whoever was, li and lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and our suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor, explorer, teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar or supreme leader, saint and sinner, in the history of mankind, live there, and look what he says, on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. Now, to think that just that little thing is what we are, not when we look at the whole universe as a whole, when we look at just a little piece four billion miles away, and to think that in that little pale blue dot, that if we were to see the whole universe, we would not even find it as a pixel, God said, I am the creator of everything, and I'm going to die for humanity that is in there. I'm going to not just die for humanity. The one person, Leif Penrose, that is in the front row, Pastor Rowley, Earl, Joe, David, anyone that's here today, when you pray to him, he's going to answer you, and he's going to love you. That is like me dying for an atom. Not in my right mind would I die for something so insignificant. But let me tell you something. Our God's love is so great, so marvelous, so miraculous, that something that we might seem insignificant means the world to him that he sent himself to die for us. That is the love that we have in Jesus Christ. So my best answer of who is Jesus Christ I think Peter gave the best answer of all when he said, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. You are God. You love in a way that we can never love. And as we came today to this house of worship, we came because we worship and we celebrate who Jesus is every week every day of our lives because 2,000 years ago, the king and designer of the universe conquered death. He somehow went to that little speck so that you and me could be forgiven of our sins and that we can live forever. All he had to do was just push it away, flick it away into existence. And he decided to die on a wooden cross and be humiliated by people that don't matter because to him, he is love. We matter more than anything in this world. And if today you want to accept Jesus into your heart and you want to let God know that I want you to be my king, I want you to sit at the throne of my heart, I ask that you stand today and in him, in adoration, in awe, that we worship and praise him together for a love that we will never understand ever. Not even when we go into heaven, not even when we're in eternity, we will spend the rest of our life worshiping in awe and adoration, especially when our eyes see who Jesus Christ really is, when we can see his wonders, when we can see what he has created, and when we can try to understand, even with our perfect brains, how is it possible that someone can love the way he loves? Church, we serve a risen God. The tomb is empty. And Jesus Christ is alive. And I'm telling you, he is coming back. Just like he came the first time to die for us. He is coming back as Christ victorious to take us to the kingdom of heaven. Let us praise together today, church. Amen.
let's uh, conclude this uh, service this morning by singing he, uh, appropriate song, He Lives. Amen? It's found in your hymnals, hymnal 251. For those of you on this side of the room. He lives, he lives, Lord, and we are alive today because he lives. I ask that you bless our church today. Uh, Lord, if anyone is struggling in their life, if anyone is struggling in their faith, if anyone came here today with anxiety, with depression, with uh, a million problems in their lives that are crushing them down, Father, I hope that today they heard a message of a God that is real, a God that, is, that cares for them, but most of all, a God of immense love that loves them and is going to save them if they open their hearts to you, Lord. So I ask, Father, that you cleanse us from our sin and that you allow our hearts to turn towards you, that we can allow your Holy Spirit to touch our hearts because it is at that old rugged cross that our salvation is found a sacrifice, a debt that was paid, a savior that is risen, a tomb that is empty, and a king that is coming to take us back with him to live forever in heaven, Lord. 
So we thank you for your blessings. We pray and also for the food that we're about to partake together and fellowship as we continue glorifying your name together in this church. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.